And we are recording, which is good. People are going to start joining here soon. Give it like 30 seconds and I'll go ahead and uh, go from there. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today we have a program on PFAS in the Canadian Arctic, identifying exposure sources, exposure sources and health effects in Nunavik, Canada. I'm joined by Dr. Amira Eker, and she's going to be talking about her research uh, as far as biomonitoring in Indigenous communities uh, and looking at substance foods uh, and how these foods are poisoned by PFAS and bioaccumulation. Uh, this program is brought to you by Che Alaska Collaborative and Health in the Environment. Uh, che Alaska is a program of Alaska Community Action on Toxic, and it's also a national uh, coalition as well, Che, uh, and we'll have their website linked uh, when we get this presentation on our website as well. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to our presenter today. Thank you for being here. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for having me. It's really exciting to be sharing this presentation with you. Um, so, like Adam said, um, my name is Dr. Amira Acker, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about uh, looking at PFAS exposures in an Inuit population uh, up in Nunavik in Arctic Canada. So, as we all know, global chemical production not only severely impacts our environment and the climate, but the chemicals can also enter our bodies and impact our health. And due to the systemic and structural racism in many countries, including Canada, Indigenous populations are exposed to higher concentrations of these chemicals and are more susceptible to their effects because of all the additional stressors that they have to endure. And northern populations have a bit of a unique story because there are various chemicals that end up in the north via atmospheric and aquatic transport from southern latitudes. And as such, these heightened exposures uh, to many of these persistent chemicals in northern populations is an environmental justice issue because these populations essentially have no control or choice in the matter. So as an example, Eric Dewey was a researcher who discovered that pregnant Inuit women had concentrations of the chemicals PCBs at 150 milligrams per kilograms. And this led to an international outcry and due to industrial, out, um, and, excuse me, uh, and due to industrial initiatives to phase these chemicals out and the inclusion of PCBs under the, the United Nations Stockholm Convention, um, the concentrations of one particular PCB, one called PCB-153, had drastically increased. So they actually decreased by 83% since the early 1990s. And this goes to show that environmental health research and policies can have an incredible impact to drive change and reduce exposures. So today, as we said, we're gonna be discussing uh, PFAS. So this is a very large family of chemicals, thousands of chemicals under the umbrella of PFAS that are used in a wide variety of consumer and industrial products. So on the screen, you see some examples of some of the consumer products that have PFAS. And we include PFAS in these products because of their water and stain resistant properties. So uh, think, uh, food packaging materials so that when you carry your pizza box, the grease from the pizza doesn't get into your hands, uh, your tifal pans so that the food doesn't get stuck onto the pan, um, your cosmetics like the waterproof mascara, all of those things have PFAS, even dental floss and paints and sealants. And very briefly wanted to show you what the structure of PFAS looks like. So essentially it's made up of a bunch of carbons that are linked together as you can see on the screen over here, those little circles are the carbon. And then you have fluorine attached to each one of those, those carbons. And when we talk about PFAS, we really talk about, in simplistic terms, we usually refer to them as either short chain PFAS or long chain PFAS. And you can imagine that the longer the chain of that PFAS, the more difficult it is to break down in the environment and the more persistent they are. So PFAS nomenclature can get really confusing. So for those who are not very familiar with PFAS, I wanted to share the list of PFAS compounds that we included in my study and the most important ones and highlight the most important ones. So you see in front of you here, five different PFAS congeners. These two, PFOA and PFOS, like the ones with the O's in them, they're kind of like your original PFAS compound. These two are the ones that are most heavily studied and most heavily regulated. 
these compounds here, PFNA, PFDA, and PFUNDA, are what we refer to as long chain PFAS. So you can see in the column, they have nine, 10, and 11 carbons in that chain that I had referred to. And because of their length, they're more persistent and they have greater biomagnification properties. And you're gonna hear me mention these quite a bit for the remainder of the presentation. To sort of, you know, uh, take it a step further and just show you how complicated this can all get. Um, so you can see in the figure ahead of you, you have PFAS. PFAS, that's the large umbrella that includes the thousands of chemicals. The chemicals that I'm going to be focusing on are actually under a subset called PFAAS, also PFAS, just you know, to make things a little bit more confusing. So for the remainder of the presentation, these are the PFAS. When I say PFAS, this is what I'm referring to. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is, and I don't know if you, can you see my mouse? Um, yeah, yep, okay, we can perfect. see your mouse. Okay, good, perfect. So, um, so under the larger PFAS umbrella, there is some other type of compounds uh, called FTOHs or fluorotelomere alcohols. Now, the reason why I wanted to point these chemicals out was that they are used more and more in, in the industry because they are uh, they supposedly less persistent and that they're supposed to be uh, linked to health, not linked to health impacts, I should say. However, the problem with these chemicals is that when they do break down in the environment, they end up breaking down into those same long chain PFAS that we're trying to avoid. So now let's go into a little bit more specific details on the PFAS concentrations in Arctic or Arctic. So how do PFAS arrive in the Arctic? So there are four main ways a person living in the Arctic can be exposed to these chemicals. The first of which is just contaminants in, in market and consumer products very similar to the way that um, people in more Southern latitudes would be exposed to PFAS. And this is um, you know, including all the, the kind of consumer products that I showed you earlier. The second is through water contamination. Now water contamination is a very important source of PFAS in Southern latitudes, but not as much when you go further North. We actually have, um, a, a, we did a small pilot project in Nunavik and tried to look into this and, and confirmed our theory that this isn't a very important exposure source in Nunavik. The third, and more importantly, is the long range atmospheric and oceanic transport from the south. And then again, it's that degradation of those FTOHs that I alluded to earlier that break down into PFOA and those long chain PFAS. Now, due to the persistent nature of these compounds and the unique environmental conditions in the Arctic, this creates a sink where these chemicals end up getting arrive in the Arctic and then get stuck. They then bioaccumulate in marine and terrestrial food webs, meaning that they enter the bodies of a lot of, uh, a lot of animals and uh, a lot of marine and terrestrial animals. And then they biomagnify, meaning that you find higher concentrations of these compounds the higher you go up in the food chain. And the highest concentrations are found in apex animals such as beluga whale, seal, and arctic birds, all of which are consumed by Inuit populations. So this figure here shows um, the trend in some PFAS compounds over time. We don't have a lot of data on this uh, because a lot of the, the apart from PFOS, PFOS, uh, we don't have a lot of trend data for other PFAS compounds. But the thing I did want to point out is that since the introduction of PFAS under the United Nations Stockholm Convention, and the industrial phase out, we did see a drastic decrease in PFOS of about 65% in 2017 as compared to 2007. And while this is really good news, we also find that there is increasing concentrations of those long chain PFAS, PFNA, PFDA, and PFUNDA. In fact, from 2012 to 2017, there was an approximate 20% increase in these chemicals. So my studies uh, make use of data from the Juan Elipeta 2017 Nunavik Inuit Health Survey. Uh, this was a cross-sectional survey. It is participatory based, and it was conducted by and for Inuit, uh, Inuit in Nunavik. The data were collected from August to October in 2017, and the survey managed to recruit 1,326 participants aged 16 to 80 years across all 14 Nunavik communities in the three ecological regions. 
As you can see, this is the map in front of you, the three regions being the Eastern Hudson Bay, the Hudson Strait, and Ungava Bay. And this PFAS study had two, uh, two objectives. The first were to determine the exposure determinants of PFAS, and then also look at the associated health effects in, um, uh, with exposure to PFAS. And I really wanted to emphasize this community-based participatory approach to all these projects. All the projects follow the OCAP principles of ownership, control, access, and possession. And that means that the Inuit are the ones who control their own data. When we have a research question, we have to come to them and ask permission from them to carry out a study. And they are involved at every stage of the entire process. In fact, the majority of the research questions that that we, uh, that we have in the first place are, are a direct result of community concerns. And we have several local partners involved from the research question formulation itself. And this includes a wide list, as you can see in front of you, the Nunavik Regional Board of Health and Social Services, the Makovic Corporation, the Juanelipita Steering Committee, Hunters Associations, both local and regional. And uh, like I mentioned, all our partners are involved from the first point of the research formulation to the actual setting up of my models in terms of like thinking of different covariates that can go into the model to the interpretation of our results. And they review all our abstracts and manuscripts before we submit anything. So this is the first set of results. So this figure here shows you the concentrations of uh, the various PFAS in the general Canadian population, which is that shorter figure over here compared to the PFAS concentrations in Nunavik. And the first thing you'll notice here is that the sum of all these PFAS concentrations in Nunavik are double those in the general Canadian population. And I should also mention that the general Canadian population is very similar to that of the general US population based on NHANES data. The second thing to notice is that the Nunavik levels of PFAS, which is represented by that in, in that red box, and those long chain PFAS are exceptionally high. In fact, two of those long chain PFAS, PFNA and PFDA, are sevenfold higher in Nunavik as compared to the general Canadian population. And this is likely at least partly driven by the degradation of those FTOHs that arrive in Nunavik. This figure here shows um, the concentrations of various PFAS uh, congeners across uh, Arctic regions. And this is a figure from AMAP, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. And these specific figures here in Nunavik are represented in the red boxes. As you can see, sorry, <laughs> as you can see, the concentrations we have here are extremely elevated as compared to some of the other Arctic populations with the exception of Alaskan men. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that those increased concentrations of PFNA, which I had alluded to earlier when I said they were sevenfold higher in Nunavik, it seems to be a, a very common theme across all Arctic populations. So it's that green bar, they seem to be exceptionally high across all Arctic populations. We also looked at the PFAS concentrations by age. So on this side, this is the way PFAS um, in, uh, concentrations differ by the different age groups. And then on this side over here, this is the difference in PFAS concentrations in Nunavik. And you can see that in both the general Canadian population and in Nunavik, all PFAS concentrations uh, increase by age. When we looked at differences by sex, however, we do actually see differences in Nunavik versus the general Canadian population. So in Nunavik, uh, PFOA, PFOA, and a compound called PFHXS were higher in males, but those long chain PFAS, PFDA and PFUNDA were higher in males versus females. And this could be indicative of the actual exposure source of these compounds. So, now we wanted to try to explore and try to understand what these exposure sources are. So we know how, the how these chemicals arrive in the Arctic, but we wanted to understand how they're actually getting into human bodies. And given the biomagnification and the bioaccumulation properties of these chemicals, we first wanted to look into country foods. So country foods are the traditional foods that are gathered from, the, from or hunted from the land, rivers, and seas. 
And these are all exceptional sources of nutrition and perfectly adapted to survive the uh, harsh Arctic conditions. So they include everything from excellent fats and vitamins and essential elements, particularly things like selenium and iron. And they're free of industrial food additives and contaminants from packaging and all sorts of different things, and they taste good. Um, and the problem, however, is that due to the global chemical production, they, there has been tendency for the accumulation of environmental contaminants in these foods. So the one thing I really wanna make clear in this presentation going forward is that the studies that we have are advocating for the protection of country foods and not the scaring away from the consumption of country foods. So, however, when I wanted to study these in a little bit more detail, um, from a statistical point of view, it was difficult to try to only look at specific foods in relation to the PFAS because so many of these foods are eaten together. So, um, be it, uh, you know, uh, Mizrak, and this is very Nunavik uh, uh, specific, but, you know, Mizrak is commonly consumed with things like caribou meat. So when you're looking at trying to figure out the relationship between the specific country food and the PFAS, it's a little bit difficult to disentangle the specific foods and the specific PFAS relationships. So the first approach we used was to try to understand what kind of profiles exist, what kind of dietary profiles exist in Nunavik, rather than looking at the individual foods themselves. So again, we use the, the food frequency questionnaire uh, uh, data that came from that uh, 2017 survey. So without boring you with the details of the statistical model, I just wanted to briefly say that I use something called a latent profile analysis. And what's nice about this model is that you can uh, plug in a lot of data from the different variables and this um, and the kind of variables that went into this were the frequency of consumption. So how often did you eat caribou uh, in the past week? How often did you eat um, a, a beluga whale in the past week? So on and so forth. You plug all these variables into the model and then it sort of just gives you a bunch of different uh, profiles that exist. And then you can compare these dietary profiles by different variables, such as age, sex, region, food security, so on and so forth. So the first thing I did was to only plug in the uh, the country food variables. Oh, I have it the opposite here. I did the first thing was the country food variables and the market food variables. So market foods being everything, you know, from the milk to the breads and everything, anything you can buy at a supermarket. And then the second one was to only look at the country food variables uh, alone. So basically this model uh, produced two types of results. The first was those overall food profiles. So that's where we um, plugged in the market and the country food variables. And we found that there were four main profiles. The first was a country food dominant group. The second was a market food dominant. The third was a diverse consumption where they tended to eat a lot of everything with different types of country foods as compared to those in the country food dominant group. And then a low consumption group. And this, um, this group basically just ate very little of everything. And then when we only looked at those country food variables, um, there was a high consumption, moderate consumption, again, with some differences in the types of foods that were eaten here, low consumption, and then almost no consumption of country foods. And the key takeaways here, when we looked at how these profiles differed by different demographics, were that men were more likely to be in that country food dominant group, and whereas women were more likely to be in the market food dominant group, Inuit age 16, uh, uh, sorry, not 16, 60 plus, were more likely to be in the country food dominant group. Inuit age 16 to 30 years, uh, however, were eating more country foods than those that were age 30 to 59. So hopefully that's a sign of like a resurgence of, of, of Inuit culture in younger populations. And that that low consumption group I mentioned, that group was linked to food insecurity. The next thing I did was to now look at how PFAS concentrations differ by those different uh, over, uh, overall food profiles. So just to orient you a little bit, that light blue uh, bar represents people who are in the market food dominant group. This is my reference group. So I wanna compare everyone to the people in this market food dominant group. And you can see that the longest graph are those in the dark blue. These are people in the country food dominant group. So you can see that individuals in this group have the highest concentrations of all PFAS compounds, which 
um, basically just proved our hypothesis that the is country foods were, an, were a very important predictor to uh, high concentrations of peaks. And in fact, there was a 50 to 57% increase in those long chain PFAS and PFOS in people in the country food dominant group. And then very similarly, this is now looking at the PFAS concentrations by those country food profiles. So it was the none, um, low, moderate, and high. Again, the light blue graph is my reference category. These are people who ate very little country foods. And you can see that people in the high country food consumption, so that's the dark green, again, have the highest concentrations of PFAS as compared to any of the other foods. And in fact, there was a 67 to an 83% increase in PFDA, PFUNDA, those long chain PFAS, and PFOS in this group compared to the non group. So the next part right now is trying to look at the specific food groups that I had mentioned. Um, we're just about to finish that analysis right now and uh, submit it to our local partners. But basically what we're doing, uh, we're using some fancy machine learning tools to try to account for some of that correlation. But the main thing that we're trying to use as well is trying to improve on our data visualization tools. So the, the results, the resulting uh, results <laughs> basically will be a, a bunch of different plots that you can play around with. So for example, you'll be able to select the chemical, you know, let's say PFOS, and then it will show you the relationships between all the different foods that were associated with PFOS, or you could do it by food. So let's say Arctic char, and then you can see what the relationships look like with Arctic char and the different uh, PFAS groups. So now we're gonna move on to PFAS and health. So we looked at the exposure sources, and now we're going to look at what we've discovered so far, um, uh, specific to Nunavik. So exposure to PFAS um, in, the, in the scientific literature has been associated with a wide variety of different health outcomes. Everything from cardiometabolic disease to uh, changes to the immune system to respiratory diseases and endocrine disruption, which means that PFAS can impact the way our hormones uh, can impact the concentrations of the hormones in the body. So the first study we did was to look at the relationship between PFAS and cardiometabolic health. So specifically in Nunavik, there was a study back that was conducted back in 2009, 2010 that found that there was an increase in cholesterol levels in lipids in relation to PFOS, which was the only uh, PFAS compound that was available at the time. And this finding has been observed in over 25 other studies. So it's a very, very consistent uh, finding that PFAS are related to an increase in cholesterol. And in the literature, studies that have looked at diabetes and blood pressure have been very inconsistent. So we wanted to see what those relationships look like in Nunavik. So we included uh, a few biomarkers, biomarkers meaning that they're just um, sort of measures of not actual disease, but measures of something that could potentially lead to disease. So things like total cholesterol, uh, low density lipoprotein, high density lipoprotein, apolipoprotein B, and triglycerides all indicative of cardiometabolic health. And then the actual health outcomes were diabetes, prediabetes, and high blood pressure. So we used uh, something called a mixture analysis. In mixture analysis, it allows you to look at a variety of diff or, uh, different chemicals at once in relation to a different health outcome. And the nice thing about using these kind of methods is that it gives you a much more realistic idea of what person's exposure. So you're not just looking at one single compound at a time because no one is only exposed to one single compound at a time. We're all exposed to a mixture of different chemicals. So very briefly, I wanted to show you some of the results we have uh, looking at this mixture of PFAS in relation to some of these outcomes. And the main thing I want you to notice here is that with regards to the biomarkers, uh, PFAS were consistently associated with an increase in all of these biomarkers. So it was, interest, it was uh, associated with an increase in total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and APD. However, when looking at the actual diseases, PFAS was only associated with prediabetes, and it was not associated with diabetes and high blood pressure, which was a very interesting finding. 
So I also wanted to talk about the um, the advocacy work that uh, we're, we're working on in uh, the lab that I'm associated with, with Melanie Lemieux. So we sent, uh, we went, we attended, excuse me, the Stockholm Convention uh, at the last meeting in September. It was an Inuit and scientist uh, delegation that was, uh, that went to the uh, Stockholm Convention with Lucy Gray as uh, the one who kind of spearheaded our group. Um, and it was, um, it really was, an incredible experience to see how these um, policies are not just driven by science, but they're really driven by politics and that they're really driven by the interpretation of the studies by different um, uh, par uh, parties. So be it you know a country that is more interested in the business of PFAS versus a country that's more interested in the environmental side of things. And I also just wanted to put, um, I also, sorry, excuse me. I also wanted to point out that uh, Lucy Gray made uh, an incredible comment during the Stockholm Convention that really drove the conversations of, uh, around PFAS to provide a human uh, on the ground perspective to it all. So rather than keeping things at a very high level of like, oh, you know, well, we need that. do we actually have evidence of this reaching the Arctic or not? It was really a human face all of uh, these uh, results. So just a little background on PFAS in the Stockholm Convention. So the compound PFOS uh, entered the Stockholm Convention, uh, the list of the persistent chemicals under the Stockholm Convention 2007, PFOA in 2019, and then PFHXS was just recently accepted into the list of persistent chemicals uh, just this past year. Like I said, we attended the Stockholm Convention to advocate for um, the uh, subset of long chain PFAS to be included in the list of persistent chemicals. And this list also includes those FTOHs. Um, in 2015, they were somewhat regulated in Canada. They're proposed for listing in the Stockholm Convention by Canada into 2021. Um, and then last year, fulfilled uh, the first two criteria uh, to be included under the list of persistent chemicals, uh, which was really, really great news. And now we're waiting to see what the next steps are, if it's going to be a complete ban internationally or if it's going to be like a, a semi-ban. Next steps. So we're currently trying to analyze country food samples for PFAS concentrations. The uh, statistical models that we ran were very informative in giving us uh, an idea of which ones are most important, but we want to also see if the age of the animal makes a difference or if there was parts of an animal that also has higher concentrations of PFAS versus um, other parts. We also wanna analyze PFAS mixtures in relation to other uh, health outcomes. Mm -hmm. So we um, just received data now for a variety of different immune outcomes. We're also looking at relationships with respiratory outcomes, and we just got approval to, uh, to uh, also measure some thyroid function in our available biomarkers to, uh, or biological uh, samples, excuse me, in order to look at this as well. And then we just want to also continue communicating the issue in the North, and then of course, jointly advocate with our Indian partners for environmental justice. So in conclusion, although PFAS concentrations um, are still way too high uh, in the North, the Stockholm Convention and industrial phase outs have been efficient in reducing exposures to these chemicals and particularly to those legacy persistent organic pollutants. Um, and the concentrations in Nunavik are way too high as compared to the general Canadian population. Like I mentioned, we're talking sevenfold higher for some of these compounds. And this is a particular uh, importance. PFNA seems to be one of those markers for Arctic exposure. And we have uh, evidence that points to PFAS contaminating country foods, which have exceptional nutrition qualities and essential to Inuit culture. And like I mentioned earlier, this, the, all these studies are really meant to advocate for the protection of these traditional country foods. And then preliminary evidence show that associations between PFAS and adverse health outcomes consistent with the literature and that more efforts surrounding environmental and health effects, such as things like green chemistry initiatives and the application of the precautionary principle is required during the formulation of these chemicals to avoid this perpetual cycle we're in where new chemicals come into the market, 
we find out they're bad, we get rid of them, get in some replacements, they're also bad, and so on and so forth. I'd like to acknowledge all of our partners and all the funders that were responsible for this work. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Akir. I really appreciate that presentation. Um, and I just want to echo the sentiment of the importance of community-based participa uh, participatory research, uh, research, you know, having the tribes and having the indigenous people, um, you know, involved in every step of the way, I think is, is super important. Um, and we're also, um, you know, doing the same research here as well, uh, because of their persistence in the environment, PFAS and forever chemicals, persistent organic pollutants, uh, you know, traveling on oceanic and hemispheric, uh, well, oceanic and wind currents um, into the Arctic being a hemispheric sink for these, uh, it's happening everywhere. It's a concern all over the world as well. Uh, in ACAT, Alaska Community Action on Toxics, we're actually, uh, a lot of our team right now is in Savunga doing that same biomonitoring. Um, and our environmental health director, uh, Vai Waghiyi, um, she talks about how this is the cultural identity and the people and her people believe that the benefits outweigh the risks, you know, because this is what they've been doing forever. They're not going to just stop. Uh, so I really like how you did say that we're not advocating that they stop eating their foods, but we don't want these PFAAs and PFAS to end up in the food in the first place. Um, I did want to give a chance for the participants, if you guys want to ask any questions. Uh, I have a few questions myself. Um, so I can go ahead and get started and then we'll see if uh, anybody else has any questions. Uh, and I guess a question for you would be, what is the biggest challenge when doing these biomonitoring trips um, in Nunavik? What, what is the biggest challenge for you and your team uh, when you're conducting a lot of this research? So with regards to the biomonitoring itself, um, I came into this project once the biomonitoring data was already conducted. So I can't speak to that directly. Um, uh, because the survey, and it was a massive, massive effort that was put together to try to go to all 14 communities, most of which are, or a lot of which I should say, are very remote and you can only reach by helicopter. Um, so that in itself was a massive uh, undertaking. And uh, so there's a lot of logistical play there, um, but I wasn't involved in that part of the project but I can speak to the country food sampling that we're doing right now. And with that, it's, it's a matter of, we had this vision of trying to um, collect as many samples as we could, and not just of the animal, but the actual food itself. But that's difficult, right? Because a lot of times people don't, rightfully so, don't wanna part with those precious country foods, especially for, for science. And then, even when we do have access to those foods, it's very difficult to try to get those foods from different parts across Nunavik, from those 14 communities, and be able to trace back where that animal was hunted or, uh, or fished, right? Sure. So sure. that has been, that has been uh, a little difficult, but we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to make do. We're working with an incredible hunter uh, based out of uh, Makovic Corporation who has been yeah, it was just been absolutely incredible at like getting us a bunch of different samples uh, from everywhere. And we're trying to just uh, come up with the best possible science that we can with the samples that we have, even if it is, a, if we treat it more of a preliminary data set rather than um, a full uh, idea of all uh, PFAS exposure in the entire region. Sure. So that has been a little bit challenging. And um, with regards to the biomarkers themselves, um, the other thing I can speak to is, so I mentioned the thyroid hormones that we're looking into right now. Uh, so thyroid hormones were not collected at the time of uh, collecting the samples themselves. So when we do measure the thyroid hormones, the question is, is, what do we do with the results? Do we report those results back to the community or not? Because the results are now five years old. So if a person has a slightly elevated a thyroid hormone level, does that mean anything? And are we causing more harm than good to report those results back? So we had to come up with a very um, comprehensive protocol of exactly, and of course, with um, after a lot of conversations with our partners to try to figure out what we're going to be doing um, with biomarker, uh, biomarker levels that are measured five years 
after the they were actually collected. Interesting. So, yeah. That's uh, another piece of the puzzle, right? I mean, that's a, that's such a great point. You know, you don't want to raise any alarms and but you want to make sure that the science is accessible and presentable to those communities who are affected. Uh, we have a, a, a couple questions here. Uh, Shannon, who's actually doing similar work in the Great uh, Lakes region, asks, a lot of work has been done on PCBs and a common message given to reduce exposure is to remove fats as PCBs tend to bind to lipids. What about PFAS? Where is the bonding to in animals? Are there biomarkers that are common in both animals and humans? Wonderful presentation. Thank you for that question. So that's what makes PFAS even more complicated. So you're right, with, uh, with contaminants such as PCBs, they tend to accumulate in fat. That's not the case for PFAS. In PFAS, they accumulate to proteins that are found in the blood. So we find uh, the highest PFAS concentrations in organs that have a lot of blood perfusion. So things like the liver or the kidney. And there was a study that just recently came out um, from California that found that PFAS is associated with liver cancers. And um, so it's, it's not as easy to avoid PFAS. I shouldn't say easy because the, the, the fats of a lot of country foods are consumed, you know? So it's, um, I don't wanna use the word easy, but it's not as uh, identifiable, let's say, as to where the PFAS is, apart from saying that it's um, that the liver has very, very high concentrations of PFAS. So for example, the pol a polar bear uh, for, I mean, I know that not a lot of communities eat polar bear, but for communities that eat polar bear, there's usually you know, advice as to avoiding the liver completely because it has exceptionally high concentrations of PFAS. Gotcha. Yeah, sure. uh, Colleen asks, is there a lab or any, uh, is there a lab or way for other communities to check levels of PFAS in their substance resources? There are a lab or if other um, So just to make sure I understand the question, um, does Colleen mean like to actually send some samples to a lab and they can check whether or not there is PFAS in it? I would, yes. Yep, yep. Colleen said yes. So. All right. Um, so I don't know of any, to be honest. Um, like I know that there are plenty of labs that do PFAS, uh, that look at PFAS concentrations, but um, I don't know if they will look at PFAS in like in like a smaller sample that's sent in by an individual. I can try to find out for you, but I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. That is also a question uh, that we get sometimes too. Um, when we release water quality studies of PFAS in different bodies of water around acreage, people are like, well, what's in my water? You know, where can I send that off to? Um, and I think, you know, as the years go on, PFAS testing is becoming more accessible, but, you know, yeah. it, I'm not sure if we're there yet as far as making that, you know, everybody can do that uh, within yeah. the community. Sean, uh, has, go ahead. I was going to say, I totally agree with you. And I think the, the kind of other complication there is that while PFAS testing is becoming a little bit more um, available, it's usually for water, not so much for the food samples, so which is another complication. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, Sean talks about water uh, contamination and surface water. You mentioned that surface water contamination wasn't considered as a potential source of contamination. How did you determine this? In Alaska, some preliminary sampling has shown that rural unlined landfills may be contributing to PFAS contamination to local surface water systems. So what we did was we looked at um, certain points. Uh, we looked at a surface water at various points around the capital of Nunavik in Kujwak. And we did find slightly, um, not elevated, but higher concentrations of PFAS as compared to some of the other sites around the airport. And which makes sense because uh, the, um, the firefighting foams that are commonly used in airports also uh, use, uh, have PFAS in them. So it wasn't a surprising finding. But if you compare the concentrations, they didn't seem to be um, high as compared to other sites. So it's it's still very preliminary data, and we haven't actually um, gone into detail. We haven't shared everything yet, so I can't go into the specifics. But we did determine that water contamination, at least in in the sites that we analyzed, 
was not an important source of uh, exposure source of PFAS. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, just looking at, yes, uh, subsistence foods uh, in, in how PFAS manifests and bioaccumulates um, at what, thousands of times? <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. Um, I will say, too, that with our water quality report that we just released in looking at different PFAS contaminated, you know, bodies of water and lakes, we found some of the highest um, near airports, right? We have a, a military base and downstream from that is Ship Creek, where some of the highest levels of PFAS. And so um, just a little more context about what's happening in Alaska. Um, Senate Bill 67 was just introduced, which would phase out PFAS from firefighting foams, which is great. That's really all it does. So that's something that we're fighting for um, as a team with ACAT. Uh, and we're actually going to be in Juneau in a few weeks talking to legislators about trying to get protective, enforceable drinking water standards for PFAS. Um, and it has great bipartisan support. Uh, but as far as Alaska goes, we feel like we're a little bit behind compared to the rest of the country that has a lot more PFAS regulation. So that's all the questions we have for now. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to uh, end with, uh, Dr. Akir? Um, I think um, just to really highlight again the environmental injustice of, of all this and the fact that it's indigenous populations that, um, that are impacted the most by this PFAS contamination problem. Um, while there, I mean, while PFAS is a global issue, um, and there is a lot of evidence of disadvantaged populations uh, that are exposed to PFAS more so than others, um, it's the indigenous populations that, uh, because of because of the fact that they live off the land, they are the ones who are exposed to the highest levels of PFAS, and it's um, yeah, it's disgraceful. So yeah. We have another uh, question from Colleen here. Uh, she says, these results are terrifying for communities that survive on country foods. How can we join in movement to stop forever chemicals or support our own public health? So I'd say uh, to Alaska and uh, ICAT are doing phenomenal work on that. You know, I think it's really about um, trying to push policymakers to, uh, to look into this further, to put in more regulations. And it's really about the, the stopping the use and production of all of these PFAS. Um, the problem we have now is that when you're looking at it from a re regulatory perspective, there is a focus on looking at the specific PFAS compound one at a time. But like I said, there's thousands of them. Um, and those are just the ones that we know of. Uh, so it's there's been a movement now to try to regulate PFAS as a class rather than the specific compounds themselves. So I think it's really about uh, talking to the policymakers and trying to drive that change from a regulatory perspective. Really, really well said, um, Dr. Eker. Uh, I would definitely agree. And that's something that we're fighting for as well. Um, and I mean, there are victories here and there, right? I mean, REI is going to phase out uh, PFAS, they said by 2024, and we've been working with other environmental coalitions like Safer States and Toxics Free Future. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we've been putting pressure on for like the last three or four years, right? Um, so to have a major retailer, you know, uh, phase out PFAS, and I know that that's for clothing and textiles, and I- It's a step I mean, in the right direction. So. Exactly, and, and yeah. PFAS, it, that's exactly it too. It's used for its resistance to water and oil and, you know, the flip side of that is it doesn't break down. Um, so, you know, I think you hit it right on the head too, is, is support your local environmental justice or nonprofit, you know, get involved, volunteer, see how you can help. Um, and yeah, so always fighting the good fight. We really appreciate your work and, and taking the time out of your day to uh, present on this uh, really important matter. My pleasure. Uh, I will say too that uh, this is a recorded presentation and it will be uh, sent out to everybody who attended today via email with that recorded link is, uh, as well as some other resources for our, our presenters work as well and some other resources on PFAS uh, that might be helpful. So I think with that, we'll, we'll cut it off there um, and thank you again. Oh wait, actually we have one more question. Oh, thank you so much. So <laughs> lots, lots of thank you. So good stuff. Okay. We look forward to, uh, we'll be in touch for sure. Okay, great. Okay. All right, thank you everyone. It's been a Che Alaska presentation and we will see you next month. Take care.